world of GPS and recalculating. It's a picture of our world and what happens to us in life. And that whenever we uh, begin to set the direction of our life, it's almost as if we enter into our GPS that we want love, happiness, purpose, and meaning. And we push the button and we said go. And we feel like we've got the directions on how we can accomplish that. And it never fails that as soon as we begin to take that trip, all of a sudden, some things happen. Some obstacles come in the way. Sometimes some obstacles come that are completely out, out of our control. Maybe an accident, maybe illness, maybe a job change, maybe a divorce. Something has happened. And when it happens, it's beyond my control, then I have to recalculate and I've got to do something else because a change has just happened. And I still want to have that love, happiness, meaning, and purpose, but apparently I've got to go a different direction. And other times, it is our choice. As we're traveling down that road, we come to an intersection, and we have to make a decision. Do I see love, meaning, and happiness going with what the world defines, or do I want to look and see what God's Word says and go that direction? And that's when you recalculate, because then you've got to head either one of those directions. And it happens through all our life recalculating. Last week we talked about recalculating life's direction. We talked to the Apostle Paul when he was on his uh, second missionary journey and how he kept wanting to go one direction and God kept moving him to another direction and it turned out that God was greatly honored in that and, uh, and the kingdom uh, was ex advanced in amazing ways because Paul listened to God's voice but it was a different direction than what Paul thought. Today we're going to continue with Paul's life and we're going to look at recalculating weaknesses. Recalculating weaknesses. Now, let me define this so that we're all on the same page. When I'm talking about the word weakness, I'm using it the way that Paul is using it in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. Weakness is not something that you control. Weakness is not some urge that you have, an urge to sin, an urge to be angry, to lust, uh, of greed, of selfishness. That is not what we're talking about. When Paul talks about weaknesses, it, those are things that come into your life that are out of your control. And they come in, they invade your life, and when they do, they always need some type of change because they disrupt what was going on, and then all of a sudden you have to recalculate because you didn't see this coming. Now it has, now some change has to happen. You've got to recalculate. And so where will you go? How will you, what will your response be? Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, it's just a great uh, passage of Scripture talking about recalculating. But I want to set it up for you. In chapters 10 through 12, Paul is having to defend his apostolic ministry to the church at Corinth. Now, he founded this church. He was there for almost a couple of years. He's written some letters back and forth to them. But in the meantime, there are people that have come inside the church and outside the church that have questioned his authority. And it's like, why should we listen to you? What apostolic authority do you have? And then some of them began to kind of puff up and, and kind of stick their chest out and say, you know, we, we think that we've got a, a lot of revelation and spiritual insights and that we should have that authority and, and not you. Well, you really don't want to get into a spitting contest with the Apostle Paul when it comes to apostolic authority. And they did, and he obliged them, and so he talked to them about it. So when he got into uh, chapter 10, he began to talk, and he really was uh, playing a, a humble card on there and all the humility and things that he had done. And then when he came to chapter 11, he said, okay, some of you are talking about that you've suffered and you've labored uh, for the Lord. Well, let me just kind of share with you the way my life has been these last few years. If, you're, if you looked in chapter 11, verse 23, this is what the Apostle Paul says. Are they servants of Christ? Am I a better one? I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings and often near death. So let me just tell you what my life has been. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. They felt if you got beaten 40 times with lashes, it'd kill you. So they said, let's just hit him with 39. It did that five different times. 
Uh, three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And you're upset because your Sunday school lesson wasn't the best, okay? I mean, just think about it. Think about the things we went through to, to drive through a McDonald's and didn't get the right order, and I'm all chapped and I'm suffering for Jesus. Okay, Paul just went through, he says, and so this is, I'm not trying to boast, I'm just telling you, this is what's going on with me. So then in chapter 12, he comes up and he says, let's just talk about visions and revelations. Apparently, they have talked about that they had received some specific visions and some revelations. And so Paul says, okay, let's talk about that. Now, it's really interesting and that Paul is getting ready to talk about something that publicly, according to what we have in Scripture, he's never told anybody before. Maybe he's told someone privately, we don't know, but publicly, he has never told about this event. But right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he talks about it. Look what he says. Verse 1, I must go on boasting. Okay, he's just saying I'm uh, doing my case. Though there's nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Let's talk about that. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Now, he's writing, talking about himself in a third person. Oftentimes, the rabbis of that day, when they would write something about themselves, they wouldn't use their own name. They would just say, I know a person, but it was them. So Paul's talking about himself. And he said, I was called up to the third heaven. If you remember, uh, earlier this year, we did a series on uh, the hereafter, and they looked at three levels of heaven. First, is the heaven was the atmosphere that you could see, and then when you get beyond that to where the planets and the stars were, that was second heaven. Third heaven is where the presence of God was. Paradise was where the presence of God was. So he said, I either had an out-of-body experience that went up to heaven, or I physically was taken up there. I don't know. I don't know. But 14 years ago, I had this revelation where I was there in heaven in the presence of God. So, well, what happened in that? Well, in verse 4, he says, and he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. He was in heaven and had a conversation and God was sharing things up there that he says that a man cannot utter. There were truths, there were insights or so that God gave Paul, but he told him, you've got to hold on to this. You can't tell about this experience. You can't tell about this experience at all. And he said, God forbade him from this. So then you come to verse 5, and he says, on behalf of this man himself, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Though I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. It's the end of verse 6. I don't know if you underline things in your Bible, but you might want to star that, that, just that little phrase right there of where he says, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. God says, I've given you this incredible revelation, this special vision. I don't want you to tell anybody about it. And part of the reason is that if Paul came back and he shared with people, someone says, I got a you know, vision, you know, I opened up my pita bread and I saw the, a picture of Elijah there and that just spoke volumes to me. And then all of a sudden Paul says, well, I went up to heaven and had a face-to-face -face with God. Well, that trumps the pita bread, Okay. But not only does that pump Peter bread, but that, 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 that kind of covers everything. And all of a sudden, if he says, I had this incredible vision, this incredible revelation, all of a sudden people say, Paul, you're the man. You're the best because you had this vision. And he says, no, I am not to be judged because of an ecstatic vision. I am to be judged 
by the things that you hear me say and the life that I live. Man, that's strong. And you see, I'm not basing my ministry on special revelations out there. He says, I've been given a word from Jesus Christ to give the good news of salvation to the Gentiles, and that's what I do. And I walk in the light of Christ, and I'm going to live for him. And if you want to look at apostolic authority, you need to listen to the words I say. Do they match up with what, what God has said? And you need to watch the life that I live. Am I living what I'm saying? That's how you determine my apostolic authority. And so Paul says, I'm not to boast on this. And so when you think about this, he goes all the way back to 14 years, which means that he's never told this before. This means that when religious leaders would argue with him, he didn't sit there and throw down, I'm going to throw down the card that I had this amazing revelation. He didn't do that at all. You know what he did talk about over and over and over? Damascus Road experience. I was lost. I saw Christ, Christ spoke to me, I made a decision for Christ and it changed my life for eternity. He talked about that experience a bunch, but he never brought this up. He was in the Corinth for two years, he never brought it up to them. The only time he brought this up was right here. And when they, in all these arguments and silly things they're talking about, he says, this is when we're going to talk about him. And so you say, well, well then what good was that revelation? Well, I just give you my own opinion on here, is that God doesn't ever waste his words or waste an experience. And I believe that when Paul, when we ever, you ever, somebody ever asked you the question, they said, who's the greatest Christian that's ever lived? And besides Jesus Christ, I think everybody I've ever run into says the Apostle Paul. Part of the reason is, I think, is because the revelation he had 14 years ago that he was writing about. Because the things that he heard from God were the things that strengthened him to be able to handle the shipwrecks, to be handled the insults, to handle uh, all the hardships, and to just keep on going incredibly. And when you read the insights in God's Word and the Holy Spirit gave him, I think that came from some of what God had already told him. And as God shared these things with him, he just put him on a different plane. And he didn't need to tell everybody where this, all the details of this vision, he just took what he had learned from that and he begins to teach and he begins to live it out. And so God gave him this, but he also knew him as a regular human just like you and just like me and so God says you've got this great revelation but you can't tell anybody but I tell you what I'm going to do something that's going to keep you from telling anybody I'm going to give you a thorn in the flesh to keep you from getting too puffed up too big on your britches and he says in verse 7 verse 7 says this he says so to keep me from being too elated or too conceited by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. He says, a thorn in the flesh. You can read a lot of different commentaries, and there are people that sit on two ends of this. The word thorn in the Bible is a word that is often translated as thorn. When I mean, you think about a thorn, uh, what do you think? What do you think about a thorn? Somebody tell me, where do thorns come from? Rosebush, <laughs> they give roses to their wives, good call. All right. you, you get a rosebush or you get it on working on wood, you get a splinter in there. But there's also a word, that same word is translated as a stake. And sometimes they would impale people with the stake, okay? It's kind of painful. So you go with the thorn or the stake. I lean to the stake. And the reason I lean towards that is because I read how Paul really wrestled with this thing. To me, a thorn can be annoying. A stake can be excruciating pain. And so God gave him this thorn or this stake in the flesh. Now, there are countless books have been written about what was, this, what was the thorn in the flesh? What was it? Some people think it was spiritual harassment. Some people think it was persecution. Some people think it was physical ailments on there. Uh, and so then when you get to the physical ailment, everybody has said things from malaria to epilepsy to headaches to speech impediment uh, to eye disease. And part of the eye disease was in Galatians chapter 4. He says, you knew that my body was ailing when I came to meet with you, and thank you for accepting me and not letting that be a detriment, and you would have gouged your eyes out for me if you could. Well, some people say that's hyperbole of saying, you know, we would have done anything we could have for you. 
Others say, well, maybe his eyes were hurting. He had an eye disease, and someone was willing to say, I'll do a cornea transplant with you. You know, I would, I would do this for you. So I believe it was a physical ailment, but this is the great thing about, <laughs> about the way God works in his sense of humor. I was working on this on Monday, okay, last Monday. Anybody know what happened last Monday? Yeah, solar eclipse, right? <laughs> if they'd have promoted it more, I think we, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have snuck up on us on there. Solar eclipse. So I am working on this on Monday afternoon and evening, and uh, I'm flipping through different uh, commentaries, and someone throws out a word and says, solar retinitis. Said, what is solar retinitis? So I Google it. Solar retinitis. It is damage to retinal tissues due to sun gazing and eclipse viewing. Paul, if you'd had this, <laughs> we're talking no thorn in the flesh. Man, don't you wish you were here, you know? So I just died laughing. I couldn't believe the same day we have a solar eclipse. They said, it's from eclipse viewing or whatever. We're not sure, and we're not sure exactly what it was. And we're thankful that we're not. Because let's say it was an eye disease, and we specified what it was then the ophthalmologist would then put a name to it. And when you would go into the, to the doctor and ophthalmologist would take a look at your eyes, they would go, you, you've got St. Paul retinitis. Yeah, Apostle Paul retinitis, yeah. Yeah, we, you've got that. Well, then what do you do? You walk out and you know your eyes are hurt and somebody comes up to you and say, hey, you got a little problem with your eyes over there? <laughs> Apostle Paul retinitis. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. It's a biblical thing. God only gives it to his choicest people, and I'm one of them. So, I mean, I can't see I'm in pain, but I'm loving every minute of it because I'm walking in the light, baby. And, uh, and we'd be cocky because we got, hey, you got the Apostle Paul retinitis. Yeah, got it, man. Yeah, yeah. And then for the rest of us that don't have Apostle Paul retinitis, we look at that passage and say, doesn't mean anything to me. I don't have that disease. No. We all have got a thorn in the flesh. There's all some kind of weakness that is hitting into our life. And, and there are some, and we're going to talk a little bit further, that God has allowed to stay in our life for certain purposes. And so for Paul, they didn't outline what it was, and he wasn't really concerned about giving them the medical definition. But what he did want to let them know is that where it came from. And that is that God is over all, and God used a messenger of Satan, and he says he used a messenger of Satan to harass me. That word harass is a word that means where you get your fist from. So it is that this messenger of Satan came and he's slapping me in the face constantly. I'm getting pummeled over here. I've got this excruciating pain of this stake that has been given to me and the messenger of Satan that is harassing me and slapping me around over here. And he says, in all of this, God gave it to me for a purpose. And he says this at the, verse of, uh, at the end of uh, verse 7, to keep me from being too elated to keep me from being conceited. If Paul shared this revelation, then others would glorify him as the great apostle and would lead him to be exalting himself. And in his pride and arrogance, he would have hindered the advancement of the gospel. And God said, I need you and I love you and I need to humble you, get a hold of that pride on you, harness you over here so that we can advance the gospel. God gave him an incredible revelation, but at the same time, he gave him some great pain to hold him down there. Now, when you read verse 8, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord. That is praying that he agonized. It's a word that means beg, persevere, agonize, that God will remove it. Listen, Paul is not some uh, theological masochist who glorifies in suffering. He's a person just like you and me. And when this weakness came, when this thorn in the flesh came, when this pain came, he did what every one of us does that's a believer. We get on our knees and we pray and we say, God, take this from me. I don't want the pain. And see, from Paul's standpoint, he says, I'm, this is painful. I'm feeling not only, I'm feeling emotional pain, physical pain, and in the midst of this, I think it could hinder my ministry. Lord, please take this away. And he begged and he pleaded. 
He was praying. And this is not one of those simple go to sleep prayers to where he just threw it out. Like, now I lay me down to sleep with this thorn I don't wish to keep. Uh, please remove it in the night. When I wake up in the morning, everything will be all right. Amen. It was not, it was not that kind of prayer. It was pleading. It was agonizing. It was on his face before God and say, take this away from me. And G. Campbell Morgan, I thought, put it in a great way. He, he, he kind of helps you feel the pain of all this. G. Campbell Morgan sees the stake as physical. The messenger of Satan was mental, constantly filling his mind with, if God was good, would he permit this? And then the unanswered prayer was spiritual. So he had physical, he had mental, he had spiritual. So the stake remained. The harassing messenger of Satan did not go away, and apparently his prayer was not answered. It was not answered in the yes that he was counting on. And in the midst of all of that, he's battling with all of this in, chapter, in verse 8. And then he gets to verse 9. And God answers his prayer, and he understands it. And it's not by delivering from the affliction, but receiving the necessary grace to bear it. Verse 9 is recalculating, because he says this, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Recalculating. I'm off of me, and I'm on to God's grace. When we ever talk about grace, we talk about the unmerited favor of God, and we think it is just for salvation, but it's so much more than that. It is a force that sustains us throughout our lives. The grace of God is what helps us just to live life. And God told Paul, after all these prayers, and, and when he was pleading, and sometimes say, you know, it says he prayed three times. I, I'm more of the, of the people that believe that three is a complete number, which means that when he got to the completion of his praying, he may have prayed 10 times, 12 times, two months, six years, who knows how long he prayed for this. But he got to a point to where finally God got through to him. He says, hey, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power works best in weakness. And all of a sudden, there's a change of attitude and perspective. In verse 9, he says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I will boast all the more of my weaknesses. Do not lose me here. Remember, at the very beginning of this message, we defined weakness as things that were not self-induced. They came from the outside. You have no control over them. This is not sinful weaknesses. This is not, this is not lust. It's not anger. It's not greed. This is talking about things that come on the outside. So don't read this verse and say, well, I'm going to boast in my weakness. Yes, I'm having a long, hard time with anger, and I'm fired up about it. Not at all. It is those things that come into your life that you don't have control over. And then in verse 10, he says, for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. This is where he defines what weaknesses are, all of these things, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. I am content with these. And when I am weak, then I am strong. Strong, not in myself, but in the fresh access of power from Christ for the hardship, the calamity, the persecution, in the insult. Now, we're going to take all of this, put it down. I'm going to give you five statements. You write them down. I'm covering them real quick for you to write down and help you when weaknesses come and you recalculate. Are you ready? Number one, victory with weakness at times comes by transformation and not substitution. We're going to leave it up there for a while for you to write this down. It is kind of the baseline foundation of this passage. Victory with weakness at times comes by transformation and not substitution. What Paul was praying for is that you need to substitute this for something else. You got to get rid of this, and God did not. But he won the victory of the stake in the flesh, not by substituting it for something better, but by transforming his attitude and his perspective. In verse 9, when he says, my grace is sufficient, I boast of my weaknesses, nothing had changed in his physical condition. If it was malaria, if it was eye infection, he still had the same thing. But his attitude toward his stake and toward God changed when he discovered the sufficiency of God's grace. It adjusted it. It adjusted my attitude, adjusted my perspective toward all suffering, calamities, and persecution. Because when he gets to verse 10, it wasn't just the, the thorn in the flesh. Look what he says in the verse 10. He said, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities, the whole thing. 
I got my arms around this now. God's grace is sufficient. There's a transformation that has come, that's taken place. Now, I'm just going to talk to you as real as can be. When weaknesses come in our life, when these things come in on the outside of our lives and hit us and they begin to almost detour us, it is fine for us to pray that God would take it away, that God would work that out. You know, it says that God desires to hear from his children and he wants us to bring our cares and our burdens to him. So we pray for it and say, oh, God, take this away. God, take this away. God, work this out. But you know, as you keep praying over and over and over and you keep walking in the word, all of a sudden there may be times when God's spirit speaks to you and he says, hey, Danny, it's not going to be substitution. It's going to be transformation. You're going to live with this weakness, but we're going to have a transformation take place. And you're going to understand that my grace is sufficient. And then in your weakness, Danny, my power will be made strong. Number two, it reminds me of my reliance on God. Whenever these weaknesses come, you can just book it, that it reminds you of your reliance on God. The stake in him, that thorn in the flesh, is a constant reminder of his dependence on God and his own inadequacies. Every time he thinks of it, he says, I got to depend on God. God's grace is sufficient. And sufficient, it means that when that word sufficient means to lift you up, to carry you, and to bear. And that God is sufficient. He will lift me up. God will carry me through this. God will, will bear the weight of any burden that's on me. And so if Paul boasted in his own strength, if it was his own strength, then he would think that he was equal to any task or any calamity. And he says, bring it on, I'm strong enough. And that is a recipe for disaster. Because once we get prideful, that's when we fall. But he said, I'll boast in my weaknesses. That when these things come and they hit my life and as difficult as they may be, I can't, I can't do this on my own. I've got to rely on the strength of God. And when I rely on the strength of God, then his power will make me strong. Number three. Whenever we get these weaknesses come in and we need to recalculate, it is a platform for praise and not a pedestal for self-pity. It is a platform for praise and not a pedestal for self-pity. Read through the New Testament and you never see Paul whining. He is not a whiner. Boy, I tell you what, you want a mission trip with him? Whew. Leave your whining card at home. Don't ever say, well, this is a real tough day. Talk tough day. <laughs> Let me tell you what my last three years have been like. <laughs> there was no whining. There's no whining in missionary journeys. I mean, there's no whining over here. I mean, I mean he, he didn't do it. And look what he says. He says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. And so when these weaknesses come, these intersections into my life, I look for ways to boast in these weaknesses. Why? For the glory of God. You see, the stake in the flesh made him acutely aware of his own inadequacies, and it prevented him from thinking that he was equal to the task of loan, and it prevented his bloated ego from crowding out the power of God in his life. And he had done so much that his pride, his ego, could have been just building up bigger and bigger. But see, God says, I'm leaving the stake in the flesh because I need to deflate that. Because I need you humble. I need you reliant on me. And you know what? In your weakness, you will be a platform for praise. I don't want you to be a pedestal for self-pity over here. And his weakness becomes this vehicle by which God's grace and Christ's power is fully manifested in himself and others. You know that in life. When people who everything has gone right in their life stand up and they give a testimony to the goodness of God, we rejoice with that and we praise him. But the vast majority of us that are sitting out here said, well, if I had a life like that, I would praise him too. You have absolutely no idea what all I've been through and all the heartaches I've had. And when someone stands up who then talks about all the heartaches, all the weaknesses, all the difficulties in their life, and yet they stand there and they say, it's only by the sufficient grace of God that I'm able to stand here. And may he be honored and glorified. Then people sit up. Both have a platform, but who has the bigger platform? It's usually the one that's been through the difficult times. The one that understands the stake in the flesh. And so he says, hey, it's a platform for praise, not a pedestal for self-pity. And fourth, it's an adjustment of action, not an excuse for inactivity. Listen, whenever something comes like that, there will be an adjustment of action. 
And um, let's, just, let's just go on the thought that Paul had a problem with his eyes. If he had a problem with his eyes, he had to make some adjustments. He couldn't read as much as he wanted to read. Maybe when it got darker, no matter how many candles he put out there, he just, it wasn't enough light to help him read, so he couldn't read what he'd like to read. Maybe he couldn't write letters like he wanted to write, so now all of a sudden he's got to dictate them to an amanuensis to, to write those things. Maybe there are things he would love to write, but yet he couldn't because he had to make the letters so big. Maybe there's some pain in his eyes, and, and maybe when, when they were getting ready to take a journey and the sun was shining so bright that he couldn't go out on that, and they had to slow down their journeys. I don't know, but there had to be some kind of adjustments. Because anytime you have a physical malady, there's some kind of adjustments. And so what he's talking about, when we do recalculating, it's not an excuse for inactivity. It's not an excuse for us to say, oh, God, I want to be a witness for you. I want to live for you. Uh-oh, I've got this thing that's come into my life. God, man, I hate that, God. Sorry, I can't live for you. No. God says, recalculating. You know, you thought you were going to be serving me over here. Recalculating. I'm going to serve you over here. And this is what's going to happen. There's myriad numbers of stories on there. Listen, some of the most famous men in history have had to walk through these difficult times. This year, we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And Martin Luther was at the, at the pinnacle of all that, the apex of the um, uh, Protestant Re Re uh, Reformation. And at age 43, he got something called uh, tinnitus. And that's a loud ringing and roaring in your ear. And as they have read his writings about his health, that for 20 years he dealt with dizziness, vertigo, loud ringing in his ear, and incredible pain on the left side of his head. 20 years. God used him in an amazing way. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, many of us say, is the greatest preacher ever. But because of all the letters that he's written, he's detailed all his illnesses, and my goodness, uh, I mean, uh, he, he used up his copay in the first couple months. Uh, I mean, all kind of things were going on with him. And there were times he would work so long that he would be bedridden for a month. Bedridden for a month. He has a mega church responsibility. And a man who everyone's listening to, and he's bedridden for a month. Uh, for the last, uh, I think it was about 30 years of his life, he had gout. And it was so bad that there were times he could not even walk and again was there confined to his house. He suffered with bouts of depression. And so constantly dealing with depression. So between depression, physical illness, overwork, man. But you know what he said? Because of this, I better understand people who go through pain. And he says, I think I'm a better preacher for it, and I think I'm a better counselor for it. He could have easily used the excuse of saying, it's inactivity, but he didn't. He said, I'll just have to make some adjustments, but I'm going to continue doing what God has called me to do. And last is this. Experience the power and presence of Christ overshadowing you. Whenever these weaknesses hit, insults, persecution, illness, difficulties, accidents, when they come and hit you, you experience the power and presence of Christ overshadowing you if you recalculate according to God's Word. This is what the Apostle Paul said. Verse 9, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I will boast of these weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That word means to build a tent. That word means to overshadow. It's almost as if there was a cloud that came up here and it was just overshadowing. And he says, I will boast of my weaknesses. Why? Because I can rest in the power of God that will just overshadow me. And he said, there's something about being in God's will, feeling that overshadowing of God, you just can't explain. And he said, that's what I need. There are a lot of things that we, we talk about today. And when you think about weaknesses, um, there's serious ones along the way, but I don't think there's ever one that's probably more heart-wrenching and challenging is, uh, is an illness that's leading to death, and to have to walk with someone through that. And how do you handle that? And how does this passage relate to that? I want to put a picture on the screen of a family that you may know. This is Jonathan Bean. Jonathan, his wife, Carla, their three kids. Jonathan and Carla, Jonathan, they were missionaries, and then came back to the States, and they, um, 
were members of our church. And then a number of years ago, he had an opportunity to go to the church at Brook Hills and be their missions minister. And he helped them and was working with David Platt as their church was, was expanding and growing in missions. But then in the 2010 and 2011, he had a brain tumor. When Jonathan had this brain tumor, it kind of set everything back, and there was a lot of heartache and some disappointment along the way, but he went through the treatments, and over the years, uh, there were ups and downs, but then there became the ups, and it seemed like everything was fine, and that, that everything was going to go well for him. But then in these last few months, he came back with a vengeance, and it spread in some other places. And um, his wife, Carla, writes a blog about it. I saw it this week, I read it, and I contacted Carla and let her know that we'll be praying for them and would she be okay if I could share her blog with this church? And she said, yes. Jonathan's 43 years old, married, three precious kids, and this is his wife writing what is called Divine Paradox. As you go through it, I'm not going to fill in the blanks of recalculating, but you just think about when she says, there has to be some recalculating all along the way. It's hard to describe the last few days, not only because they have been difficult, but mainly because they have been unexpected. Honestly, when Jonathan began having motor challenges due to tumor growth back in December, I knew that some sort of physical disability would be a reality for our family. In my mind, it was clear that having a permanent weak arm or using a brace or a cane could be our new normal. As we process this reality, God provided a way for us to sell our tri-level house and to move into a new home where Jonathan would have all he needed in the main level. As his left side weakness worsened towards the end of May, a wheelchair began to replace the cane in my thoughts. And as frightening as this idea was, I felt we would be fine. I would probably need to stop working in order to make my husband's work a priority. I almost envisioned myself helping him getting ready every day, driving him to the office and typing for him. I imagined life would be hard, but we would be fine. In July, Jonathan got very sick. He got weaker than I'd ever seen him, and as we were trying to get him better from what we thought only was a GI hurdle, we discovered that the tumor was moving into his brain stem, and what had once been just a scary thought became real. We needed more treatment, more chemo, more radiation. I would not return to work. In fact, I would need to become a full-time helper to Jonathan since it was now evident that his left side would not go back to normal. Rather, it would only improve some if treatments work. Processing all of this was hard, but Jonathan and I have always been a team, and I could picture us teaming up to make things happen. We would need to rearrange our activities and priorities, but we could do it. Getting him dressed in the morning, driving him to work, going to PT and OT regularly, typing for him. I knew it would be hard, but I was ready. We had a plan. It always feels good to have a plan. First, we need to get his GI system back on track and then complete the radiation as he began oral chemo. Six weeks later, later, second oral chemo, hopefully all towards a successful arrest of the tumor, we would be fine. Then last week happened. Hospice was called. As we initiated the process, my mind quickly built new expectations. We would stop treatments. Jonathan's body, now free of toxic treatments, would regain some strength and we would enjoy sweet family times for many days and that would be fine. We have now been in hospice care for a week and my expectations have been shattered as quickly as they were built. Hospice workers are a blessing. They're sensitive people who strive to support the patient and his family in every possible way. But hospice is impossibly difficult. It means coming face to face with an undesired reality and with decisions that one wishes never having to make. Jonathan's health continues to deteriorate, and there have been curveballs that I never envisioned. Things are not fine, but God's promises remain. So we do not lose heart, quoting Scripture. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day after day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. During the sad, hard week, I have struggled with what has felt like contradictory concepts in my heart. For days, I felt that one side of me is begging for a miracle from the Lord, knowing that it is medically impossible for Jonathan to recover. 
yet believing that God designed Jonathan's body and he is in absolute control over each one of his cells. He rules over the laws of the natural world. He commands the universe. The other side of me is willing to accept that if God chooses for Jonathan's body not to recover in this world, but to receive ultimate healing in his presence, he can be trusted. His plan for our family is still good and perfect. He will carry Joanna, Daniel, David, and me through. He will not forsake us. These two seem impossible to reconcile. They seem opposite, but the Bible teaches both. The Lord delights in his children's prayers, and by God's infinite grace, we have access to the throne of grace to find mercy and help in time of need. And because of Jesus' blood, we have the freedom to let our requests known to God by prayer and supplication. I can keep begging for a miracle. God is not offended. He sees my heart. He hurts with me. Illness is not part of his original plan. And in the same breath, I can confidently say, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus himself taught us that. He begged for a different outcome, yet he modeled for us what it looks like to have your complete trust in the Father's perfect plan by willingly saying, your will be done. We don't say your will be done because we lack faith in God's power over his creation. And we don't ask the Father for a miraculous intervention because we don't trust that he may have a better plan for us. Both asking and submitting are acts of faith, and they can coexist. It is a divine paradox that ultimately reflects God's character. He is powerful, and he is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, there are things that happen in our lives that we don't understand. And sometimes we are torn as to what our prayers should be. Fathers, we follow the example of, of Paul. You're not intimidated by us asking that when these difficulties come, that you would remove them and you would provide healing, you would provide clarity of direction, you'd provide uh, a release from the pain. But then at the same time, Lord, we know that we rest in the sufficiency of your grace. And so, Lord, it is our prayer today that um, each one of us, will be looking at their own lives and allow you to take an inventory in there. And if there's some weaknesses that have, have intersected our life and there's some recalculating that has to go on, and Lord, if those recalculations have taken us in a way opposite of your word, may there be some more recalculating that would take us back towards your word. And may we be able to say, even as Paul does, that I boast in my weaknesses because when I am weak, then I am strong because I'm giving free access of the power of God through me. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.